Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, an unbelievable fossil of a Jurassic marine reptile has shown that it had a unique structures embedded in its flippers that made it adapted for stealth swimming. The red supergiant star Betelgeuse gets a confirmed friend. A new species of prehistoric mole has proven to be a rather unexpected discovery and much more. Our next monthly news roundup featuring discussion of news from a few months ago by myself, Ben and Amelia is up on Patreon, so go check it out if you're one of our Patreon supporters. We'll have the next one up soon, I promise. But yeah, no, that was just an update on ichthyosaurs because I like them, so that's about yeah, it. Yeah, he does. What, you, what did you do your masters on, Ben? Ichthyosaurs. What did what you do did your you dissertation on? Ichthyosaurs. Yeah. What, what are you going to do, do your PhD, PhD on? <laughs> Maybe ichthyosaurs. I'll see. What are you going to do your PhD on? I'd like to do ichthyosaurs. Yeah. Some good ones. There you go. Our top story this week is the astonishing discovery of a fossil flipper from a Jurassic marine reptile, which preserves lots of exceptional soft tissues around the bones, including some never before seen features. These features reveal that this underwater predator had stealth wings that enabled it to swim silently through the water and sneak up on its unsuspecting prey making this one truly terrifying prehistoric hunter. The marine reptile in question is a species of ichthyosaur, which are best known for being the rather dolphin-like reptiles that lived during the age of the dinosaurs. However, not all ichthyosaurs resemble dolphins, as these animals were highly diverse and gave rise to many different species over their time on Earth. Recently, we interviewed Dr. Dean Lomax, one of the paleontologists who studied this remarkable specimen, to learn more about this extraordinary discovery. Yeah, so it was the fossil was found by a fossil collector called Gil Goetz in actually in 2009, and he found it really by chance. He visited a quarry of a there was basically a temporary exposure, and he asked got permission to collect fossils, and legit, he found a big block cracked it open with his hammer, looked at it and was like, what is that? And then he just frantically looked around for as much material as possible and uh, luckily managed to pull together all of the pieces of what is a, a giant metre long flipper. It's missing the very tip, which is the base like the humerus and like the radius and ulna bones. But we think it was probably ripped off by another predator because it wouldn't make any sense. We, we go in a bit of detail in the paper, but it wouldn't make any sense for it just to be this isolated flipper and without that section. And we also know from fossil evidence that other ichthyosaurs are often targeted around like this kind of joint going into the, the shoulder girdle. But yeah, it was found in uh, in Dottenhausen in a quarry in Germany by Georg Goetz in 2009. The species is Temnodontosaurus trigonodon. So this is your top of the food chain, apex predator of the early Jurassic seas. So right off the back of a big extinction event in the Triassic, you kind of reset the clock on the evolution of ichthyosaurs and the kind of feeding dynamics, all that sort of stuff. And then this is your, your, your really big ichthyosaur. You're talking kind of 10, 12, maybe even up to about 14 meters long animals, adult size based on more isolated giant uh, remains of vertebrae and jaw bones and things but yeah that's what we identify I, it was my role one of my key roles in the, in this research was not only to obviously identify and work on a whole load of broad things with with Johan who led the research but obviously the rest of the team but the key thing for me was to identify this specimen which took quite quite some time because although there's quite a few Temnodontosaurus trigonodon known from the Posidonia shale this species itself isn't really fully fully described and there's quite a bit of variation as well so it spent i spent a lot of time looking at a lot of material when i when i first saw the fossil i was pretty stunned into silence which says a lot about me because i usually don't shut up talking about fossils and so the the fossil itself is really spectacular you kind of had one of those moments where you you're looking at the entire fin so the first thing is what you kind of immediately notice is you've got the entire outline of this flipper preserved so from pretty much the the bones just below the the radius and the ulna and the, and the humerus right down um to the very tiny little finger bones and you've got these individual digits that so fingers like our fingers all the way down in the fin but then they stop and then you have this massive extension of just soft tissue that's unsupported by bones that's unlike anything that we that we see in modern animals or or, or even extinct creatures so that's one immediate thing you see 
but then when you take a slightly closer look, you follow it down. This is basically like a very long wing-like flipper, and it and the the end because it's unsupported, it probably would have acted a bit like a winglet, like you have on a plane, so it could move up and down a bit like this. But then the the intriguing thing is you then see all these like banded stripes going across the the surface of the skin, and and when you see that, it's just like what <laughs> what is that? And they're that, that's what another feature. But then the key thing you see, and the key thing that I immediately was drawn to, is that down the the trailing edge, so the other side of the of the flipper, is you have these what we originally kind of thought were sort of spike-like structures. And so we were like, what what are they? You, have, you know, I've seen thousands upon thousands of ichthyosaurs, never seen anything like that before. But it turns out that they are. A very unusual structure that are entirely comprised of, of ultimately kind of hardened car cartilage, which we term an entire new uh, new name for, which we call them chondroderms. And so, yeah, collectively, these features are have never been seen in any living or extinct animal ever. Remarkable. So together, basically working with with Johan Lindgren and and also Sven Sachs and a whole bunch of people uh, who, who kind of. I guess we put it as it's a big multidisciplinary team. So you worked with paleontologists, biologists, engineers, physicists to try and understand what all these different features meant in terms of its functionality. And after going through so much detail and, and look using things like synchrotrons, use uh, so, so basically scanning these things on like using intense kind of beams of light and radiation and all this sort of stuff to try and get inside the, the finer details of these structures. And then also creating a, a virtual model of part of the flipper to test these sorts of things and comparing them with um, similar-ish but very different structures that are preserved. For, for instance, one of the key things we do is look at owl wings. So owls have, well, they're incredibly well known for, for having the ability to, of, of silent flight. So when they're hunting at night, and of course, like our ichthyosaur, it has giant, giant eyes. Uh, when they're hunting at night, they use their eyes. They've got keen eyesight, but they actually they develop this ability for silent flight. So basically their prey don't hear them coming. And these structures in the wings are very similar in a sense to what we see in our Temnodontosaurus. And to even to a point, these types of structures or strut like structures have also been used on things like wind turbines to reduce noise in, in the kind of modern uh, soundscape. And so we think collectively all these sorts of things it reveals that ultimately Temnodontosaurus was a, an enormous stealthy hunter. So diving deep in search of its prey of squid, fish, other marine reptiles and using its enormous eyes and managing to, to spot its prey, it's then able to reduce noise uh, up or basically using its massive, ta massive tail as well to swim up very quickly and boom, take its, take its prey away. So it's, you know, it's just think about this thing at like 10 to 12 meters or so literally in stealth mode where nothing can hear it coming and then it bang just takes its prey out it's a totally novel unusual unique way of, of hunting as well that again we've never seen in the in any animal i mean i knew that temodontosaurus was like a cool animal you know a great predator and everything but this is just absolutely unbelievable it takes it to another level um and so do you think this could have been a widespread feature among ichthyosaurs do you think any other species had these features as well that is the question. Yeah, that is the question. So that's one of the things that we are going to look into in more detail, as you might suspect. There are some features of other ichthyosaurs where the soft tissue preservation is there. So you might recall the famous Holzmarden, again, where this specimen comes from, the Posidonia shale uh, formation material, where you where you have the kind of either, if you're very lucky, a full outline of the, of the soft tissue preserved, the body outline of the animal, like Stanopterygius. And in some of these individuals, their flippers, they have very different, I might point out, very different structures. They're not cartilage either, but they have very different uh, bone, bony-like kind of rays, as we, as we kind of call them, a bit like some fish have, in their fins. And clearly they were doing something different to Temnodontosaurus, but also they, they don't have the same structure. So it's hard to answer your question. I strongly suspect, and I've been asked this a bunch of times, and we've been pondering this for a while, I strongly suspect if we find obviously many, many more ichthyosaurs with soft tissue, which is obviously a rarity in its own right. I suspect we'll find either the same sort of structure, so these chondroderms and the other features in the fins, or we'll find something similar to them as well. I think within the time frame of Temnodontosaurus and the fact that it's got the gigantic eyes and it's the giant size, it had to do something to thrive 
but also to find its its niche rather than just being a big predator relying on eyesight and relying on the fact that it's got big big teeth and hunting its prey it had to do something especially with competition from other like, big ichthyosaurs and things so obviously clearly having these adaptations for stealth is, is quite remarkable but from the even broader perspective whether whether we have these features on other ichthyosaurs is is difficult to say for now as, as i say probably but it's whether even earlier ichthyosaurs had these things too so or whether they just were developed within temnodontosaurus and one of the things i'm really keen to find out and we, we may never know but we may be able to make some weird kind of archaic link going back millions and millions of years who knows permian carboniferous devonian you don't know of, of something that perhaps there's a feature like these chondroderms found on another earlier uh, reptile or other creature that may be able to link back to or link in time to ichthyosaur. So there is that broader side of things too, even from the function and whether it, whether ichthyosaurs had them, but the potential that you've got another archaic link to a kind of their pre pre ancestors at some point. So yeah, that's something I'm really fascinated for for uh, you. That's very really exciting. I mean, it's kind of one of those discoveries that opens up like an entirely new avenue of research that like we didn't know existed before. So it's absolutely incredible. And uh, congratulations on the paper. And uh, thanks for answering these questions. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate it. And, and it's always nice. I, I like to think back when, say, when I saw this specimen and now that our research has finally been out and, and, and published after six years of working on this, this beautiful fossil is you, you think to, to Mary Anning and her brother Joseph who found the first ichthyosaur skeletons brought to the attention of science. And of course, the first specimen was a Temnodontosaurus. And so it's been over 200 years since we've known about Temnodontosaurus. And even just with this one fossil, one new discovery has kind of revolutionized the way we think about that animal and ichthyosaurs generally, and, and perhaps even marine tetrapods, and even thinking bigger picture, just the way in which we interpret and understand soft tissue structures in, uh, in prehistoric animals. So yeah, truly, truly fascinating and, and looking forward to the future of uh, more research on this fossil going forward. A massive thank you again to Dean for doing that interview and congratulations to him and the whole team on getting this phenomenal paper published. Also in the paleontology news this week, a collection of titanosaur footprints uncovered in southern Mongolia has been studied and revealed some previously unseen features of the soft tissues of these dinosaurs' hands and feet. These long-necked sauropod dinosaurs lived about 66 million years ago and left these footprints while walking across a sandy environment. These natural casts reveal that both the hands and feet of these titanosaurs were covered in quite large protruding scales on their undersides. The foot scales vary considerably across different parts of the appendages, meaning they had very diverse scale types on these parts of their bodies. The hand tracks also possess peculiar overlapping spur-like scales sticking out of the sides, back and undersides, which the authors hypothesize are adaptations to help these giant dinosaurs with their traction as they walked across sandy environments. As if this all wasn't amazing enough, these track casts additionally show for the first time that in these titanosaurs, the large claws on their hind feet were mostly encased in soft tissues. This means that only a small part of the claws, an estimated less than 10% of them, actually protrude past the skin, which is very different from how these animals are usually portrayed. It's a stunning discovery and quite a game changer for paleoartistic reconstructions of titanosaurs, as it looks like only the tips of their hind claws would be seen in life. In other paleo news, a new species of prehistoric mole has been found in Catalonia, and it's proven to be a bit of an unexpected discovery. The partial skeleton of this small digging mammal was unearthed in rocks dating back more than 3 million years, and includes a damaged skull and much of the right forelimb. Initially, scientists thought this animal was an example of an already known extinct mole species. However, after further preparation of the fossil, it was revealed to be a new species, named Volcanoscapter ninoti. The surprising aspect of this discovery was when they realized it shares many features with certain other mold species only known from North America, despite the fossil originating from Europe. 
So, it's possible that Volcanoscapta was the product of a previously unrecognised prehistoric migration of this particular mole lineage from America to the Iberian Peninsula. Another mystery surrounding the new species concerns how it became fossilised in a volcanic crater lake environment, given that this was a highly specialised digging animal that would have spent most of its time underground. Maybe it actually swam in the lake and drowned, as some living moles can swim quite well, or perhaps it was dropped in by a predator. Whatever the case, this is a remarkable discovery, shedding new light on the evolution of these wonderful creatures. In other news, we're coming back to a fascinating story we had eight months ago, where it was hypothesized that Betelgeuse, a tantalizingly close red supergiant, has a companion star. Betelgeuse famously dimmed at the end of the last decade, leading some to believe it was closer than we thought to its death. When it got brighter again, astronomers started wondering why it had dimmed at all, and eventually found its light had been blocked by a large cloud of dust. Investigations into Betelgeuse's luminosity did raise questions about the massive star's six-year brightness variability cycle. A paper that came out in October last year claimed that the most likely reason for this dimming cycle was that Betelgeuse actually had a companion star, and was therefore part of a binary star system. Despite Betelgeuse being one of the most loved and well-known stars in the sky, this elusive companion had never been observed until now. Published this week in the Astrophysical Journal Letters are astronomers' findings that Betelgeuse does indeed have a companion star. The images were captured by the Gemini North Telescope after failing to find the star on other facilities. It has an estimated mass of one and a half of our own sun and marks the first time a close-in companion star has been detected around a red supergiant. A brilliant discovery showing how hypotheses in studies can lead to verified discoveries. Finally for this week, there's been a concerning spike in grey whale deaths recently, as nearly 50 North Pacific grey whales have washed up along the coasts of California, Washington and Oregon in the USA this year as the whales complete their annual migration from Arctic feeding grounds to breeding areas in California. In comparison, only 31 grey whales were reported stranded throughout 2024, so this year's number has already surpassed that total. From 2019 to 2023, grey whales experienced an unusual mortality event, during which the population declined by an estimated 45%. Scientists fear the current wave of deaths may be a continuation of that event. The exact cause of this continued die-off remains uncertain. Necropsies have been limited by the inaccessibility of carcasses and advanced decomposition, which makes tissue analysis difficult. However, some causes are known. Several whales have died from ship strikes, and many others show signs of severe malnutrition, having empty stomachs and reduced fat reserves. This all points to food shortages in their Arctic feeding grounds, likely driven by climate change. Rising ocean temperatures and diminishing sea ice are disrupting the populations of organisms that grey whales rely on to survive. Grey whales are considered vital indicators of ocean health, and their increasing mortality rates reveal how climate change is disrupting marine ecosystems on a global scale. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to email us at 7dos.stories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Chang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chaffa Chaffa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drav Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Prietbrajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Patrikas, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.